Hello and welcome back to the fifth lecture on this course on chemical process design. In this second part of lecture five we're going to examine the subject of distillation optimization. It's a pretty common fact that most distillation columns that operate on refining complexes today are probably operating under different conditions and with different product specifications to those that they were initially designed for. This demonstrates that it is possible to optimize a single piece of hardware for a number of different operating conditions. Our strategy will be to minimize energy use and to see how this energy use varies with a variation in product specifications. We'll see that the most powerful tool we have to evaluate a design is process simulation. It is fair to say that good simulation skills are a key competency for any design engineer. Modern simulation tools such as HiSys, Pro2, Unisim and Aspen are powerful and simple to use, but equally it is very easy for an inexperienced user to obtain a lot of bad data. It is important to be able to validate modelling work, either against a known working system or, in the case of a student design, to check against case studies in the literature. The first and most important step is to ensure that your thermodynamic model is fit for purpose. The distillation design and optimization process is iterative and it is not uncommon to have several hundred simulation cases completed by the end of a design process. One challenge for the engineer is being able to communicate the data and information from a large number of simulation cases in a clear and concise way. We'll have a look at a number of ways in which that can be done with an emphasis on graphical presentation. So here on the whiteboard I'm going to draw up an outline for our optimization strategy. The first step in this strategy is to agree a design feed basis. That is to say, we know what the feed composition and flow rate is. We also know what our product specifications are going to be. Crucially, we also agree on a thermodynamic model and have validation data such that we're confident that this model is fit for purpose. Now, the type of data that you might wish to validate your thermodynamics against, especially for distillation purposes, is probably going to be bubble point curves and dew point curves for selected species within your mixture. You're unlikely to find data that pertain to the entire mixture species that you're dealing with unless you're commissioning your own experimental work, which in a company you may well do, but in a, an educational setting and even in a, um, a smaller company setting you probably won't have access to. And so if you've got a hydrocarbon feed, go and look in journals such as the Journal of Chemical Engineering Data, go and find out what the experimental data are for bubble point and dew point, and then simulate those, cross check and see if they agree. If you don't know how to obtain bubble point and dew point curves out of simulation software such as Unisim, have a look at the tutorials that I've made for Unisim and there will be a tutorial there explaining how to do this with the case study tool. Once you've agreed what your goalposts are, then we need to start to think about the unit operation itself. So the first thing we do is to set the operating pressure, and the operating pressure is set by the minimum condensing temperature. Your minimum condensing temperature, in turn, is set by your cooling utility. So think what cooling utilities you've got available. You've got air, but where on the planet are you actually going to be building this system? If it's air in Saudi Arabia in the summer, or air in winter in Canada, then you've got two completely thermal um, constraints here. You might have cooling water. If it's cooling water in the UK, then the summer temperature and the winter temperature are going to be two different things. You don't want your process to become unreliable in summer conditions, but to work perfectly in winter conditions. So think about what your cooling utility is, and then remember that you've got a temperature approach. The coolest that you're likely to be able to get your process stream is probably to 20 degrees warmer than your cooling utility or thereabouts. Okay, 20 degrees C is a generous temperature approach, but design conservatively and you can guarantee the thing's going to work. But you must remember, high pressure processes are inherently hazardous. Try and keep the pressure as low as you reasonably can for the design constraints that you have in hand. The third thing is to set the feed preheat. Now, ordinarily, when people start to learn about distillation, they say, oh, it's a bubble point feed. Not necessarily the case at all. So your feed may well be multi-phase. It depends what heating utilities you've got available. And we'll talk more about feed preheat in a few slides time. Now, your heating utility might well be something like steam. It might be five bar steam. It might be 15 bar steam. Go and figure out what is going to get your feed in the region of bubble point-ish or maybe multi-phase-ish and see how you can achieve that. 
So remember your temperature approaches again. If you've got 5 bar or 15 bar steam, remember you've got that 20 degree temperature approach. That is to say you can only get your feed 20 degrees cooler than your utility temperature. Don't forget as well heat integration. It is very common on distillation systems to heat integrate between the residue and the feed for energy recovery. The next thing to think about is energy use. And what typically we're going to do is to look at energy use as a function of a number of different things. Typically, we'll look at energy input versus the number of stages for varying specifications of distillate and residue. And also, we'll look at energy use for the feed location as well for a set number of stages. In that way, we can figure out what the ratio between stages in the rectifying section and st stages in the stripping section are, and then figure out from there what the total stage count should be. Now, when you're doing work like this, always work in theoretical stages. Then, once you've got your study done in theoretical stages, translate it into real stages, preferably using real design data for a similar case, or if not, maybe using efficiency correlations, maybe mercury vapour phase efficiency or other such correlations. Then, change your feed preheat. See how it affects the piece of equipment mechanically. We'll talk about how feed preheat is intimately linked into column diameter at the end of this part of this lecture. So let's do this by means of example. Let's start by optimising the feed placement. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix the feed rate, we're going to fix the feed temperature, and we're going to fix the operating pressure to start with. We're going to set up a simulation and we're going to run it at different distillate and residue specifications. And then we're going to stop and think and consider what the most expensive heat exchange duty is. Usually, especially in refining situations, you're talking about reboiler duty. Reboilers will typically be steam fed and that steam utility is expensive both financially and of course in terms of carbon footprint. However, don't have a closed mind on this, because if we're dealing with cryogenic systems, then very often the most expensive utility is going to be the refrigerant sent to your condenser. So that will also be the most carbon intensive as well. So always think about what your most carbon intensive and what your most expensive heat exchange duty actually is. It may be the reboiler, it may be the condenser, or it could well be both. Now, then what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the simulation at a different feed location. And we're going to start gathering data. And the data we're going to gather is heat exchanger duty as a function of feed stage. Then we're going to change the distillate and residue specification and repeat the whole cycle again. And what we're going to see is we're going to build up a series of graphs that give us information on how sensitive that duty is to feed placement. So let's have a look at a worked example. Here on my whiteboard, I've got a very simple distillation column, single feed, two product. And the feed composition is a four component mixture containing n-pentane, n-hexane, n-heptane, and n-octane. Note here, I can consider my feed in a way to be symmetric because I have 10% by molar content of my least volatile and most volatile component and 40% um, on a molar basis of my intermediate volatility components. And going from least volatile to most volatile, I'm just adding a single carbon atom on in each stage. And we'll see that the symmetry of this feed is actually reflected in the data that we get from the simulation cases. Now, let's set some key components. Let's say my um, light key in the residue is going to be n-hexane and my heavy key in the distillate is going to be n-heptane, and my initial specifications are 2.5 mole percent of each. Now, you'll have done some initial design work before we start optimising. You'll have run a shortcut column, you'll have used that shortcut column to go and look at a rigorous system, and you might have even done a little bit of optimization on that rigorous system in terms of converging it to your required key component specifications. Again, if you've forgotten how to do this, go and look at my distillation tutorials for Unisim, and you'll have some worked examples there on actually how to set up and optimise to convergence a distillation system. And so for this case we're going to have a basis feed rate of 100 kilomoles an hour. We're setting our column pressure at 2 bar absolute. The initial design comes back at 31 stages with a feed stage of 15 and there as well we've got some duty information around our condenser and our reboiler. So 
Let's go and go through our optimization strategy that we outlined and plot some data out. So here on my whiteboard, I'm plotting my reboiler energy divided by my minimum reboiler energy. I could just plot reboil energy. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. But sometimes what you find with changing key component specifications is that you get a lot of data offset by a great deal on the y-axis. And so sometimes for clarity, it's nice just to normalize it, to bring it all together, and you can make a possibly better choice And because it's easy to compare between cases. So I'm plotting normalized reboiler energy on the y-axis. Reboiler energy, because it's a hydrocarbon system and it's a reboiler where all the energy is being used. On the axis, x-axis, I've got my feed stage, and it should be noted that feed stage number one is my condenser, so I'm not going to be feeding there, but the lower the stage number, the closer to the condenser that I'm getting. So the curve that I've plotted on this graph is for my base case. This is when I've got 2.5 mole percent of light key and heavy key respectively in my residue and in my distillate. So let's change my component specifications. Let's go for 2.5 mole percent of heavy key in distillate and 5 mole percent of light key in the residue. If I've got 5 mole percent of light key in the residue as opposed to 2.5 mole percent, then I'm not having to work quite as hard in the base of the column. And so I sort of need less energy to affect that separation if I were to put that feed lower down in the column. In effect, I don't have to have quite such a high reboil ratio because the separation I'm trying to achieve is far cruder. If, however, I start to tighten up the tolerances, let's see what happens if I go from 2.5 mole percent of heavy key in distillate to 1 mole percent of heavy key in distillate, keeping the light key and the residue the same, I have to work the top of the column a great deal harder. If we think what this means, it means we have to run at higher reflux ratio, which means we're condensing more liquid, which means we're chucking more liquid back into the column, which means we're having to boil up more liquid, which means we have to use more energy. And so the closer I move my feed towards the condenser, the harder that section of the column has to work, the harder that rectifying section has to work, and so the more energy is required to actually affect the separation. And we can see exactly the same if we change the light key specification in the residue. And the purple lines here show that if I go to a more lenient light key specification to start with, I'll start to reduce energy use. But as soon as I tighten up my light key, I have to work the stripping section of the distillation column a lot harder, which again needs more energy. And so we've got some symmetry here in the data that we've got, but what we can clearly see is that there's an optimum. And the best place to put the feed is going to be around stage 15, so long as we have our 2.5 mole percent in our residue and in our distillate. If we're going to be running the column at different heavy key and light key specifications for an extended period of time, then we may wish to start thinking about possibly redesigning this such that we have the feed in a more appropriate location. But by plotting data like this, we can make a very informed decision about where exactly that feed gets placed for minimum duty. So now that we've figured out where our feed is, we can think about how many numbers of stages we need. Now remember, the number of column stages is a trade-off between capital cost and operating cost. The taller the column, the more expensive it's going to be, but the easier the separation is going to be going to do. The shorter the column, the cheaper the column, but the harder we've got to work it because we're going to need higher reflux ratios, higher boil-up rates. There's going to be higher vapor traffic as a result, so we might need a wider column and the operating cost there is going to be more expensive. Over a column lifetime, you'll find that operating cost tends to dominate, and so a little, little capital expenditure up front may offset operating cost at a later date. So let's think about a strategy to optimize our total number of stages. We've decided on our optimum feed stage location, so that allows us to fix the ratio of rectifying to stripping stages. I'm gonna call that NR to NS. Then, what we're going to do is we're going to run our simulation for our chosen distillate and residue composition as before. Then we're going to consider our most expensive heat exchange duty, our most carbon intensive heat exchange duty, usually the Roy boiler, but don't forget the condenser for garage systems. 
and then we're going to change our total stage count but keeping the ratio of rectifying to stripping stages the same. So now that we know what that ratio is we can change our number of stages and move our feed accordingly. Then we're going to plot some graphs and see what they tell us. So let's go and look at this. It's going to be the same system as before and this time what I'm plotting on the y-axis is going to be reboiler energy over minimum reboiler energy same as before on the x-axis I've got the total number of stages at constant nr to ns. So let's start with our datum case again this is two and a half mole percent of heavy key and light key in our distillate and in our residue and we can see that this curve is quite interesting. If we look at the shorter columns increasing or decreasing the number of stages greatly affects that reboiler energy. If we've got quite a tall column, adding on a few stages or taking off a few stages actually has a very small impact on the total of energy requirement. And so there's going to be some subjective decision making to be made done here. Because we can build a taller column and have very little effect on our energy, or we can build a shorter column and try and figure out whether that energy use is going to be acceptable over the lifetime of the system. So let's plot out what these curves look like for other specifications and we'll find that actually they look like a sort of family of curves. So the dotted lines above the datum point are where I've got one mole percent either of the heavy key or the light key, so the column's working harder. The solid lines below the datum curve are where I've got more lax specifications. I've got five mole percent of either the light key or the heavy key. And so the slacker the distillation requirements, the lower the energy, the more um, stringent the distillation requirements, the higher the energy. So the other lesson here is make sure that you understand what your specifications are and why they're set that way. Because distilling to high purity when you don't need to is a massive energy hit. Now, if we examine these data, we can start to think, well, where should we choose our optimum point to be? We could put it at the point, of a point, point where the gradient gets steeper, or we could elect to have a slightly taller column and maybe get away with less of an impact on operating costs if our specifications vary a bit. It's subjective. Subjectively, I've decided to go with 34 stages here rather than the original 31 stages, although you could probably make a strong argument for 31 as well. Ultimately, it will come down to a financial analysis. Let's finally think about feed preheat and how your feed preheat affects the mechanical design of a column. So here on the whiteboard is a sketch of my distillation system again, only this time what I've done is I've heat integrated the feed with the residue. So this is a typical example of uh, energy recovery in a distillation system. Your residue is going to be hotter than the feed. You don't want to waste that energy. So use your residue to either totally or partially provide some of the feed preheat. Let's think about how this column is working and where the energy is coming from. So energy is being put in in the feed and in the reboiler. If we start with the reboiler, we're producing vapor and we're throwing some of that vapor back into the column as boil up. So there's vapour rising in the bottom of the column. When we get to the feed stage, if we're putting energy in our feed, our feed may be multi-phase. Let's assume here that my feed is indeed multi-phase and the vapour component of that multi-phase feed is going to add to the vapour traffic going up the column. And so our vapour traffic will increase as we go above the feed stage. And so the vapour flows in the rectifying section will be greater than in the stripping section. We're going to be taking energy out of this system in the condenser and we've got a total condenser illustrated here so we will be putting back a certain amount of that condensate as reflux and let's say that blue arrow there is an indicator of the reflux that goes in from the reflux drum but of course our feed is multi-phase phase, so as soon as we go beneath our feed stage the liquid flow rate is also going to increase as a result of that multi-phase nature. Okay so here we have a system where we have vapour going up and liquid going down, we have energy being put in in the feed and in the reboiler and energy extracted in the condenser. Let's see what happens when I change something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to decrease the feed temperature. So all of a sudden my reboiler duty has to increase because, well, I need the same amount of energy going in. 
So as my reboiler energy increases, I'm going to be boiling up more liquid. And so my vapour flow in the base of the column is going to increase. OK, now let's assume that my feed is still, well, maybe um, single phase. As that liquid from the feed comes down, it's going to be condensing some of the vapour from the reboil. And so above the feed, there's going to be less vapour going up the column. So I've reduced the vapour traffic in the top half of the column, but increased it in the bottom half of the column. So looking back at the top half of the column, the vapour gets condensed by the reboil, by the condenser, sorry, it's a total condenser. And then I'm putting back reflux from the reflux drum, which is the blue arrow going down, the thin blue arrow. My feed is liquid phase, and so my liquid uh, flow rate increases dramatically below the feed stage. OK, so by changing the feed preheat, I have changed the volumetric flows of gas and liquid in different parts of the column quite significantly. Let's stop and think what that means from a hydraulic perspective. If you recall from our discussion of multiphase reactors, we saw that if your gas velocity gets too high, you can end up with flooding. We don't want flooding in pieces of distillation equipment. We don't want flooding in any piece of process equipment. And so the way in which we can alleviate that problem is by reducing the gas velocity. For a set volumetric flow rate, the way to reduce the gas velocity is to increase the diameter of the column. And so if, for example, I've reduced the amount of feed preheat, it means I've increased the vapour flow in the base of the column because my reboil is having to work harder to supply all the energy to the system now. That means my volumetric flow of vapour has increased, which may mean I've approached a flooding limit. In which case, I'm going to have to make my column wider in order to drop the vapour velocities to make sure my column doesn't flood. So, stepping back, there's a very important mechanical implication here for how you preheat your feed. It's not impossible, but a slight pain to build columns of differing diameters above and below the feed. It's far easier just to build one constant diameter cylindrical section. And so your choice of feed preheat is going to determine how you mechanically design your column. And it will determine whether that column design is expensive or less expensive. OK, so let's just summarise those few points. We've seen that higher feed preheat will reduce the reboiler duty. Higher feed preheat will also increase the amount of tray flooding above the feed, or lower amounts of feed preheat will increase the amount of tray flooding below the feed, as we've just illustrated. So we can use feed preheat as a tool to alleviate constraints in existing distillation columns. If a distillation column has been running and its duties have shifted over time and we're approaching critical flooding in some areas, by changing the feed preheat we may be able to shift that flooding point and, if you like, de-bottleneck that system. If you're designing a column from scratch, we might want to optimise that feed preheat such that it gives us our lowest combined duty on our heat exchangers, but also a single column diameter above and below the feed. So the final part of your optimization process is to look at the column section diameter as a function of feed temperature. Now, there are tools in Unisim, and again, there's a tutorial on how to do this, that will allow you to calculate section diameters very, very quickly. And so, again, you can run some simulation studies where you look at different feed temperatures, do a column sizing calculation, look at the column diameter that's returned, and you'll find that you'll get a diameter above a feed and a diameter below the feed, so for your stripping section and for your rectifying section. Plot these out and find the point, or in this case points, where the column diameters are equal. Maybe that then should be the point at which you design, as long as you've taken all the other information into account as well. So let's have a look at what our optimised example looked like. So we started with a certain feed composition. We started with certain key component specifications. We varied those key component specifications. And we've evolved our initial design to a final design. And actually, it hasn't changed in this particular example by that much. We've increased the stage count by three. We've shifted the feed position slightly. And we've managed to keep the operating duties about the same because, as it turned out, coincidentally, 
the initial design was fairly close to being pretty good. Not always the case by a very long means. OK, let's recap a few key points. So firstly, over the lifetime of a distillation column, operating cost is going to dominate. Your optimization strategy is therefore to minimise this cost. So to do that, you minimise your energy use. For most distillation systems, the reboiler temperature is going to be significantly above ambient. Hence, the reduction of reboiler duty is going to result in less energy use. But don't forget cryogenic systems. For those systems that are subambient, don't forget that refrigeration is incredibly expensive and very carbon intensive. And so it's going to be a condenser duty that dominates the energy and carbon footprint. When we went through our strategy, we optimised the feed placement first. We fixed the ratio from that study of the rectifying to stripping stages. Then we optimised the total number of stages at fixed NR to NS ratio. Finally, we then optimised the feed preheat, aiming for equal diameter in the stripping and rectifying sections if possible, whilst also trying to get the lowest combined reboiler and condenser duty.